one of the, the absolutely pathologic situations for any animal or human is to be able to access repeated dopamine surges without effort or any pursuit that's self-directed and, or that's directed, I should say. Mm -hmm. So for instance, cocaine, a drug which potently increases dopamine or methamphetamine, which potently increases methamphetamine, but doesn't require any sort of um, adaptive action pursuit, except to acquire the drug and spend money on no it. You'll sacrifice. You'll sacrifice. So it, essentially what ends up happening is the circuit that gets rewarded is only the drug seeking behavior and no other behavior will give the kind of potent yeah. dopamine release that cocaine or methamphetamine will, which is why they are so pernicious. Now, likewise, right, right. I'm not... Well, plus, plus they have that powerful reinforcing effect, right. right? So not only do you get that kick, but what's reinforced by the dopamine release is the behaviors that were right prior, particularly right prior to the ingestion. And if it all that is, is the drug taking behavior, that's all that develops. That's right. You build that monster inside your head. That's right. So I can see where you're going on the pornography. Front. Right. So I was starting to get a lot of questions. I was kind of surprised. I thought, well, you know, I'm male and, you know, maybe that's why they feel comfortable asking. But people were saying that uh, we're asking about pornography and they were asking, you know, I, I, I realized we want to, um, you know, to, I'll just be direct about, it. they were asking whether or not masturbation was bad. They were asking whether or not um, masturbation with ejaculation was particularly bad. And here's my stance on this. I'm a biologist and a neuroscientist, not a psychologist. But what we know for sure is that if an individual repeatedly engages in this circuitry, let's say, say masturbation and pornography with increasingly um, potent forms of stimulation that are on a screen, yeah. a couple of things happen. First of all, what's being reinforced? What's being reinforced is a high dopaminergic response to watching other people engage in sexual behavior, which is very different than being in a first person sexual experience. Okay. So right there, you know that what's being reinforced is not actually any kind of improvement in communication yeah, skills. It's voyeurism. It's voyeurism. And and as these questions started to come in more and more, I started to realize there was a lot of kind of undertones of people talking about fear of or experience with sexual dysfunction that clearly pornography yep, can lead yep. to. And here I'm specifically talking about males. I, I actually don't know the literature on females. So here I'm talking about... Females don't use visual pornography to the same degree. I see. They use literary pornography. I see. So... Yeah, yeah. So, and then you start to think about, okay, what happens in the cascade or the arc of, of sexual arousal and, and orgasm? What happens is that initially there's a, a it's parasympathetically dominant, meaning if somebody is too uh, stressed, they actually can't engage in sexual behavior. The arousal response doesn't occur. Erection is blunted, but the actual orgasm response and ejaculation is strongly associated with the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which has nothing to do with sympathy, has everything to do with, it's a kind of a stress response. And then it reverses to a parasympathetic response. And a hormone called prolactin increases dramatically after ejaculation in males. What does that do? That blunts dopamine release and testosterone for a very long period of time, which makes sense if pair bonding and sort of, you know, in our species anywhere, there's this idea that then other molecules would be exchanged with partners, pair bonding, potential for raising mates, et cetera. Without getting into a huge discussion about that, the point is this. Masturbation and pornography are potently tapping into the dopamine system and can undermine mm -hmm. the very processes of what I consider healthy processes of finding a mate, you know, dating, communication, eventually, if it's appropriate, sexual well, interaction, it et cetera. Like it's undermining pair bonding. And pair well, bonding. So, okay, so here's a question. If, if, you're, if you're seeking sexual release through pornography and you go through the whole cycle and you get a prolactin release... Do you bond with yourself? Huh. So this is very interesting. The um, it's the biology explains it as what's left there is a kind of an open loop, a kind of an emptiness, right? Because bonding with the self is a is a complicated notion. I mean, it ha there's a healthy version of that, of course, loving oneself and yeah. um, and and yeah, self referencing. Yeah. And and again, this is more uh, your dom far more your domain than mine in terms of uh, what a healthy self relation is. But in the absence of uh, a real partner there of an absence of real sexual partner, there's an open loop of neurochemicals, including oxytocin and prolactin. The dopamine, remember, dopamine goes up during pursuit anticipation, then peaks and then crashes below baseline after orgasm and ejaculation. So this kind of low that people fear is putting them into an A-motivated state. We can think of this, if I were to kind of expand on it, would be it's this, it's this kind of um, neurochemical, psychological equivalent of making your home environment filthy for a while. 
not actually putting you into this positive amplification of dopamine. So it depletes the dopamine system. And it's likewise in drugs of abuse and addiction, it eventually depletes the dopamine system. Initially, there's a huge dopamine surge with drugs of abuse like methamphetamine and cocaine. But over time, people are using more and more to achieve what is not such a great high. You even see this a little bit with um, kind of consumption of energy drinks. Like people are taking more and more chemicals within their energy drinks and they're thinking about loud, fast music, energy drinks, this kind of stacking of dopaminergic tools. Now that's not as pathologic. In fact, I'm, I'm, there are some energy drinks I'll occasionally drink and I enjoy them. Um, I don't think we need to be entirely afraid of, of pursuing or engaging in things that release dopamine. Obviously, healthy sexual behavior, food that we love, social engagement, all of these things can be dopaminergic. It's the big peaks in dopamine that are not associated with any prior effort or organization of self that are particularly dangerous for the human being. Yeah, well, you could see that, that you could see that, that that's a cardinal danger of, of uh, affluence then. That's right. This is why the children of... Right. Uh, you know, you know, that's right. you, you know, you cannot get rats addicted to cocaine if they live in their natural environments. Is that right? You can only get rats addicted to cocaine if they're isolated rats in a cage. Yeah, they won't bar press for cocaine in the natural environment. And it's because they have alternative sources of dopaminergic gratification. Very interesting. So, yeah, yeah the, it's very interesting. Yeah, the That's children of very wealthy people who are overindulged, uh, I've seen that many times, many, many times, and it is a very sad sight. Um, yeah, well, they're not optimally deprived, eh? And that, that issue of optimal deprivation, that's, that's a killer issue for an affluent society. There's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that, remember, guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if, I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily gonna carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, right? The, it, especially young kids who are consuming a lot of pornography, the brain is learning sexual arousal to other people having sex. So you're going to program yourself into being a voyeur. Or, yeah, or just create challenges in, in sexual interactions with, uh, you know, with, with peers, yeah, with, a, with a real partner. Right? Mary Harrington has the three laws of porno dynamics, and the second law of porno dynamics is the law of fap entropy. And it says that whatever you start out wanking to will get progressively more intense over time. And I think that this is sort of speaking to that ever, ever sort of escalating amount of... Um, the wildness that you need to watch in order to get an ever decreasing stimulus that comes back. Yeah. And you know, here I'm, I'm approaching this only through the lens of biology, right? I'm not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm certainly not, um, political in it in any way, at least not, I have ideas about politics, but I just don't discuss them publicly. But the, but the idea here is that, you know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it in its availability, and it's extreme forms, it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind, extremely palatable food, extreme pornography, um, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. And Anna will tell you that, and I'm sure she did, that the higher the dopamine peak, the bigger the drop afterwards. And it's not that you drop to baseline, you drop below baseline. So. Again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad. They just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. And you're saying perhaps take a break from that and there may be uh, an ability for yourself, your system to reset. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, all the things that we're talking about with pornography could be superimposed onto food or could be superimposed onto real sex, right? Um, that one also has to be cautious there, right? But the cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states, these are natural rhythms that existed in the nervous system. We had to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. I'll say it again, I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit. You can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. 
it needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true, but you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also, that's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, et cetera, when we're pursuing things, but the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. So you go down that track and then, ah, there it is. You know, you get some berries or you get, you know, let's get prehistoric about this, or you get to kill the prey and eat it. And then it gives you energy to continue this pursuit or to reproduce. I mean, there's a reason why humans and other animals seek out reproduction is that every, every species, but certainly humans have two innate desires built into them, whether or not they decide to actualize this or not, is the desire to protect young and make more of its own species. Every successful species does that. Even if people don't have children, in general, people care about children because they of what they represent. Very few people dislike children. I mean, there are a few mutants out there that dislike children, but you always worry about those kinds of people.